Hello there. My name is Faye Pien Son. I have been an elementary and middle school teacher for 22 years, and I'm so excited to join you today in reading chapters 54 and 55 of the Ichabod. Let me share my screen here. Chapter 54, The Song of the Ichabod. The Ichabod had just drawn breath. With its usual sound of an inflating bagpipe, when Daisy said, What language do you sing in, Ichabod? The Ichabod looked down at her, startled to find Daisy so close. At first, Daisy thought it wasn't going to answer. But at last, it said in its slow, deep voice, Icarish. And, and what's the song about? It's the story of Ichabogs. And of your kind, too. You mean people? asked Daisy. People, yes, said the Ichabog. The two stories are one story, because people were born did out of Ichabod's. It drew in its breath to sing again, but Daisy asked, what does born did mean? Is it the same as born? No, said the Ichabod, looking down at her. Born did is very different from being born. It is how new Ichabod's come to be. Daisy wanted to be polite, seeing how enormous the Ichabod was. So she said cautiously, does that sound a bit like being born? Well, it isn't, said the Ichabod in its deep voice. Born and borned are very different things. When babies are borned, we who have borned them die. Always? asked Daisy noticing how the Ichabod absentmindedly rubbed its tummy as it spoke. Always, said the Ichabod. That is the way of the Ichabod. To live with your children is one of the strangest people. But that's so sad, Daisy said slowly, to die when your children are born. It isn't at all, said the Ichabod. The bonding is a glorious thing. Our whole lives lead up to the bonding. What were we going and what were we feeling when our babies are bonded gives them their natures. It is very important to have a good bonding. I don't understand, said Daisy. If I die sad and hopeless, explained Ichabog. My babies won't survive. I've watched my fellow Ichabogs die in despair one by one, and their babies survive them only by seconds. An Ichabog can't live without hope. I'm the last Ichabog left, and my bonding will be the most important bonding in history. Because if my bonding goes well, our species will survive. And if not, Ichabogs will be gone forever. All our troubles began from a bad bonding, you know. Is that what your song's about? Asked Daisy, the bad bonding? The Ichabod nodded its eyes fixed on the darkening snowy marsh. Then it took yet another deep bagpipe breath and began to sing. And this time it sang in words that the humans could understand. At the dawn of time, when only Ichabogs existed, stony man was not created with his cold flint-hearted ways. Then the world in its perfection was like heaven's bright reflection. 
no one hunted us or harmed us in those lost beloved days. Oh, Ichabogs, come morning back, come morning back, my Ichabogs. Oh, Ichabogs, come morning back, come morning back, my own. Then tragedy, one stormy night, came bitterness, born did a fright, and bitterness, so tall and stout, was different from its fellows. Its voice was rough, its ways were mean, the likes of it had not been seen before. And so they drove out with angry blows and bellows. Oh, Ichabogs, be born did wise, be born did wise, my Ichabogs. Oh, Ichabogs, be born did wise, be born did wise, my own. A thousand miles from its old home, its bonding time arrived. Alone in darkness, bitterness expired, and hatred came to being. A hairless Ichabog, this last, a beast sworn to average the past. With bloodlust was the creature fired, its evil eye far seeing. Oh, Ichabogs, be born did kind. Be born did kind, my Ichabogs. Oh, Ichabogs, be born did kind. Be born did kind, my own. Then hatred spawned the race of man. Twas from ourselves that man began. From bitterness and hate, they swelled to armies, raised to smite us in hundreds. Ichabogs were slain, our blood poured on the land like rain, our ancestors like trees were felled, and still men came to fight us. Oh, Ichabogs, be born did brave, be born did brave, my Ichabogs. Oh, Ichabogs, be born did brave, be born did brave, my own. Men forced us from our sunlit home, away from grass to mud and stone, into the endless fog and rain. And here we stayed and dwindled. Till of our race, there's only one survivor of the spear and gun, whose children must begin again. With hate and fury, kindled. Oh, Ichabogs, now kill the men. Oh, kill, now kill the men, my Ichabogs. Oh, Ichabogs, now kill the men. Now kill the men, my own. Daisy and the Ichabog sat in silence for a while after the Ichabog had finished singing. The stars were coming out now. Daisy fixed her eyes on the moon as she said, How many people have you eaten, Ichabog? The Ichabog sighed. None so far. Ichabogs like mushrooms. Are you planning on eating us when you're born? Did time comes? Daisy asked. So your babies are born believing Ichabogs eat people? You want to turn them into people killers, don't you? To take back your land? The Ichabod looked down at her. It didn't seem to want to answer, but at last it nodded its huge shaggy head behind Daisy and the Ichabod. Bert, Martha, and Roderick exchanged terrified glances by the light of the dying fire. I know what it's like to lose the people you love the most, said Daisy quietly. My mother died and my father disappeared. For a long time after my father went away, I made myself believe that he was still alive because I had to 
or I think I'd have died as well. Daisy got to her feet to look up the Ichabog sat into the Ichabog sad eyes. I think people need hope nearly as much as Ichabogs do. But she said, placing her hand over her heart, my mother and father are both still here and they always will be. So when you eat me, Ichabog, eat my heart last. I'd like to keep my parents alive as long as I can. She walked back into the cave and the four humans settled down on their piles of wood again beside the fire. A little later, sleepy though she was, Daisy thought she heard the Ichabog sniff. <laughs> Chapter 55, Spittleworth Offends the King. After the disaster of the runway mail coach, Lord Spittleworth took steps to make sure thing, uh, to make sure such a thing would never happen again. A new proclamation was issued without the King's knowledge which allowed the chief advisor to open letters to check them for signs of treason. The proclamation notices hopefully list, listed all of the things that were now considered treason in Cornucopia. It was still treason to say that the Ichabod wasn't real and that Fred wasn't a good king. It was treason to criticize Lord Spittleworth and Lord Flapoon, treason to say the Ichabod tax was too high, and for the first time, treason to say that Cornucopia wasn't as happy and well-fed as it always had been. Now that everyone, everyone was fright, too frightened to tell the truth in their letters, mail, and even travel to the capital dwindled to almost nothing, which was exactly what Spittleworth had wanted. And he started on phase two of his plan. This was to send a lot of fan mail to Fred. As these letters couldn't have all the same handwriting, Spittleworth had shut up a few soldiers in a room with a stack of paper and lots of quills and told them what to write. Praise the king, of course, said Spittleworth as he swept up and down in front of the men in his chief advisor's robe. Tell him he's the best ruler in the country the country's ever had. Praise me too. Say that you don't know what would become of Cornucopia without Lord Spittleworth? And say you know the Ichabod would have killed many more people if not for the Ichabod Defense Brigade and that Cornucopia's richer than ever. So Fred began to receive letters telling him of how marvelous he was and that the country had never been happier and that the war against the Ichabod was going very well indeed. Well, it appears everything is going splendidly, beamed King Fred, waving one of those letters over lunch with the two lords. He had been receiving more cheer, he had been much more cheerful since the, for the forgeries had started to arrive. The bitter winter had frozen the ground so that it was dangerous to go hunting. But Fred, who was wearing a gorgeous new costume of burnt orange silk with topaz buttons, felt particularly handsome today, which added to his cheerfulness. It was quite delightful watching the snow tumble down outside the window when he had a blazing fire and his table was piled high as usual with expensive foodstuffs. I had no idea 
So many Ichabogs had been killed, Spittleworth. In fact, come to think of it, I didn't even know that there was more than one Ichabog. Oh, yes, sire, said Spittleworth with a furious glance at Platspoon, who was stuffing his, himself with a particularly dish, delicious cream cheese. Spittleworth had so much to do. He had given Flap, Flapoon the job of checking all of the forged letters before they were sent to the king. We didn't wish to alarm you, but we realized some time ago that the monster had, uh, he coughed delicately, <coughs> reproduced. I see, said Fred. Well, it's jolly good news you're finishing them off at such a rate. We should have one stuffed, you know, and hold an exhibition for the people. Uh, yes, yeah, sire, what, what an excellent idea, said Spittleworth through gritted teeth. One thing I don't understand, though, said Fred, frowning over the letter again. Didn't Professor Frodisham say that every time an Ichabod dies, two grow in its place? By killing them like this, aren't you, in fact, doubling their numbers? Ah, uh, no, 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 sire, not really, said Spittleworth, his cunning mind working furiously fast. We've uh, actually found a way of stopping, stopping what happened uh, by um, banging them over the head first, suggested Flapoon. Banging them over the head first, repeated Spittleworth, nodding. That's it. If you can get near enough to knock them out before killing them, sire, the, um, the doubling process uh, seems, to, seems to stop. But why didn't you tell me of this amazing discovery, Spittleworth, cried Fred. This changes everything. We might soon have wiped Ichabogs from the cornucopia forever. Yes, sire, um, it, it is good news, isn't it? said Spittleworth, wishing he could smack the smile off Flapoon's face. However, there are still quite a few Ichabogs left. All the same, the end seems to be in sight at last, Fred said joyfully, settling, setting the letter aside and picking up his knife and fork again. How very sad that poor Major Roach was killed by a Nicobob just before we began to turn the table on the monsters. Very sad, sire, yes, agreed Spittleworth, who of course had explained away Major Roach's sudden disappearance by telling the king that he'd laid down his life in the marshlands, trying to prevent the Ichabod coming south. Well, this all makes sense of something I've been wondering about, said Fred. The servants are constantly singing the national anthem. Have you heard them? Jolly, uplifting, and all that, and, but it does become a bit sangy. But this is why. They're celebrating our triumph over the Ichabogs, aren't they? That must be it, sire, said Spittleworth. In fact, the singing was coming from the prisoners in the dungeons and not the servants, but Fred was unaware that he had 50 people or so trapped in the dungeons beneath them. We should all, we should hold a ball in, in celebration, said Fred. We haven't had a ball in a very long time. And it, Seems an age since I danced with Lady Islanda. Nuns don't dance, said Spittleworth crossly. He stood up abrupt. Flapoon, a word. The two lords were halfway toward the door when the king commanded, wait. Both turned. King Fred suddenly looked suddenly displeased. Neither of you have permission to leave the king's table. The two lord ex lords exchanged glances. Then Spittleworth bowed and Lapoon copied him. I crave your majesty's pardon, said Spittleworth. 
It's simply that if we are going to act on your excellent suggestion of having a dead Ichabog stuffed sire, well, we must act quickly. It might uh, rot otherwise. All the same, said Fred, fingered, fingering the gold medal that he wore around his neck, which was embossed with the picture of the king fighting the dragonish monster. I remain the king, Spittleworth, your king. Yes, of course, sire, said Spittleworth, bowing low again. I live only to serve you. Hmm, said Fred. Well, see that you remember it and be quick about stuffing that Ichabod. I wish to display it on the people. I wish to display it to the people. Then we shall discuss the celebration ball. 